Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Mary Jo, and thank you to the Groton Senior Center for once again, um, you know, having an opportunity to take some questions and, and try and give folks some updates on Washington, D.C. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on, and there's a lot to talk about. We've got about an hour. I guess that's sort of uh, what they've allotted to us. By the way, there's coffee and donuts from Killingly uh, over there if you uh, uh, want to, you know, help yourself, because it was you know, a coffee event that we organized here. Here today, so I mean, obviously, as I said, there's there's a ton going on. Um, I'm not going to filibuster up here. I mean, I'm going to hopefully just talk for as as Mary Jo said about five or ten minutes because there is an issue that I really did want to kind of foot stomp this morning that I think is significant, uh, particularly. Uh, for um, older Americans, but also, I think, frankly, for all Americans, which is a, a bill that was introduced on Wednesday, Social Security 2100 Act, which, um, again, the way it works, and I, I know a lot of you are pretty savvy in terms of the legislative process, you know, a bill gets introduced by a lead sponsor, usually there's a couple co-sponsors, and then it sort of makes its way to the subcommittee and full committee process. Social Security 2100, when it was introduced on Wednesday, which is the 137th birthday of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who's the president who signed the, the Social Security Act uh, back in the, in the 1930s, um, had 204 co-sponsors, original co-sponsors on Wednesday. Again, the total size of the House of Representatives is 435 members. So really, on, on day one, it, it almost has a majority uh, built in right right uh, from the get-go. That is a significant sort of message about the fact that this is not just sort of a um, pie-in-the-sky proposal that sort of uh, got thrown out there to, to talk about this issue. Um, it's actually something that has very deep support um, in the House of Representatives. Uh, the lead sponsor is uh, Congressman Larson, John Larson from Hartford. Um, uh, John uh, sits on the House Ways and Means Committee. The House Ways and Means Committee actually has cognizance over the Social Security program, and John is the uh, chairman of the Social Security Subcommittee. Okay, so this is you know somebody who actually controls the process, uh, certainly at the initial stages, the committee process, um, and it's a bill that he's been working on probably for about the last six or seven years. He's had input from the uh, comptroller or the currency, uh, which is basically the auditor of the uh, federal government. Um, and and uh, again, lots of input from uh, folks who are advocates for seniors, uh, employer groups, uh, uh, insurance and finance groups, because uh, the Social Security, particularly for older Americans, is the bedrock of retirement. And in terms of just what we are looking at as a country demographically, uh, in terms of shortfall, in terms of re retirement security, the private sector, frankly, is just just as concerned as, as seniors about where the country is headed. Again, just sort of quick um, review. You know, a lot of people sometimes call Social Security an entitlement, okay, like it's some kind of public assistance or a welfare uh, benefit. But as I think a lot of you know, um, when the, the law was signed into uh, law by uh, uh, President Roosevelt, the, the real name of the program is the Old Age Survivors and Disability Insurance Program insurance program. And again, it was set up with uh, premiums that were paid in by workers and employers. It was a matching contribution. Back in the 1930s, it was a 1% withholding, 1% uh, from um, uh, workers and 1% from uh, employers. Again, it was a very basic benefit. There were groups that were excluded from Social Security uh, at the time. Uh, if you worked uh, in agriculture, if you worked in hospitality, like uh, uh, restaurants, or the, you, those folks were not included uh, in the program when it was first started. And over time, it has evolved. Um, it has obviously expanded to pick up people in other sectors of the U.S. economy. Uh, and, um, and, and again, one point I just want to make sure is, is not forgotten is that it is not just a, a senior citizen program. It also covers survivors, children who lose a parent. And um, today, there are about 7 million young Americans who Social Security provides benefits for. I, I had a brother who died at age 26 and left a two-year-old. Um, and the, the Social Security system was there to pick up uh, my nephew Christopher's um, economic situation. And that story has been repeated. I, you know, I know there's a good friend of mine here who could speak passionately about his, his family's experience when his father died um, sitting here. And uh, Paul Ryan, uh, the former speaker, his dad died when he was a teenager. And again, Social Security was there to pick up his financial um, uh, 
you know, situation. Uh, so, so again, this is not just a senior program. It helps young Americans who unfortunately um, survive uh, the death of a parent before they, they become uh, an adult. Uh, it also covers people on disability. Uh, again, that was an expansion that occurred uh, like probably in the 50s or 60s, I don't know exactly when, but again, for people who go through uh, the Social Security disability process uh, because of an injury, uh, because of a chronic illness, uh, a cancer, um, again, it is still sort of that insurance that um, people who have paid into uh, are, you know, can, can get help with uh, when they're, again, uh, suffering from something they have absolutely uh, no control over. Today, and it's in the New York Times this morning because there's a, actually a fairly lengthy story about this legislation, which I just mentioned, uh, there are 63 million Americans who receive Social Security benefits, old age, survivors, and people with disability. Uh, again, because of what's happening in terms of the aging of our population, and, and um, I see a lot of young people here, I'm really glad you're here, um, but you know, we are at a real sort of inflection point in terms of the aging of our country. Uh, the projections show that because of baby boomers who are hitting the Social Security system at an increasing rate, it's going to go from 63 million to 80 million. And the, um, the, the protections that were put in the last time Social Security was really modified in a significant way in the 1980s, some of you know the infamous story about uh, a Republican president, Ronald Reagan, and a Democratic speaker, uh, Tip O'Neill, uh, actually were able to sit down and hammer out um, that uh, revision to the program. They did boost the uh, withholding. At that point, it was 5% withholding for, for workers and, and employers. Uh, today, after a period of number of years and steps, it, it is now 6.2% that's, that's uh, withheld. Uh, it, it did not, however, uh, it capped uh, when people have to actually uh, continue to pay in to the system. So today, if your income hits 132000 today, you stop paying in um, to, to the program. It's, it's the cap. On, on Social Security. And uh, many people have been criticizing that cap, uh, that it really, um, really, Warren Buffett, of all people, uh, actually uh, has spoken pretty powerfully about the, how unfair it is that he stops paying into the Social Security system when his income hits 132,000. Uh, he, he reported, uh, he always publicly reports his income, uh, and he, he make, I don't know, he made it like 40 or 50 million dollars, and he talked about how, you know, his net real Social Security tax at that income level, given the fact that he stops paying in at 132,000, is less than one percent. Whereas his, uh, you know, secretary or his staff person who maybe makes 70 or 80 thousand is paying the full six percent. So, um, so anyway, that's sort of the quick snapshot. Again, a system that is going to get uh, more challenged because of what's happening demographically uh, in the country and the fact that um, it has not been adjusted. Uh, since the since the 1980s, in terms of where we stand today, uh, in the meantime, uh, there's been uh, you know problems for seniors, which uh, Mr. McCarthy and I were just talking about that you know we've heard much about over the last few years. There's a cost of living adjustment that's built into Social Security every year. The Labor Department calculates the um, consumer price index based on a whole basket of um, goods that they use, whether it's food, whether it's uh, prescription drugs, you know, whether it's uh, consumer products, and they spit out a figure that, that basically calculates based on you know, what, what the inflation is that's going on in the U.S. economy at that point. As many of you know, during the Great Recession, we went about two or three years where there was a 0% increase in Social Security. Again, prices were depressed during that time period in, in that um, index, and there was a lot of really pretty, you know, scared and, and almost desperate seniors about the fact that you know, their, their cost of living didn't go down. Uh, their cost of living for things like prescription drugs and property taxes and other uh, items um, you know, were completely overlooked with that COLA formula that really is um, more of a formula for working age Americans than it is uh, seniors. Um, the, um, the other part of the problem, you know, of the program that we've heard a lot of complaints about is that the minimum Social Security benefits, so let's just say you're a low-income worker who's been paying, you know, their quarters uh, to qualify for Social Security, 
based on your income, because that's how the, the, the benefit is calculated, um, there are seniors that are below the poverty level in terms of what Social Security actually pays. And Emma King, who's uh, my staff uh, assistant, and she used to be the senior citizen director up in Coventry, Connecticut, could tell stories about the fact that there are seniors who, uh, you know, in a, on a monthly benefit, 500, 600 bucks a, a month, that's uh, barely subsistence. So the minimum benefit is very low. The COLA has been very, uh, um, kind of depressed in terms of just you know trying to keep up with the cost of living uh, for seniors and there's been sort of a overall a, a, a bit of a uh, I wouldn't go as far as say a decline but certainly a plateau for seniors at a time when the US economy is now picking up speed in terms of uh, inflation etc so Social Security 2100 is seeking to address this problem. The first and fundamental problem, and again, I'm, I'm really glad there's some young folks that are here, because one thing that I hear, and I have two kids, one who's 28 and 24, is that frankly, there's a lot of skepticism for people looking out into the future about whether or not Social Security is really gonna be there for, for them. Even though, again, this program goes back to the 1930s, has never missed a check uh, during that time period. And this graph, which I know is kind of hard to see when you guys are way back there, but again, this is a graph that was prepared by the comptroller of the currency, which shows um, the trust fund, there was a surplus that was built into the Reagan, Tip O'Neill deal back in the 1980s, because they realized the baby boomers were coming, and, and there had to be some kind of cushion to sort of address that problem. So the 6.2% uh, withholding rate um, was, was intended to at least give, give uh, the program an opportunity to get ahead of the curve. But unfortunately, because of the speed with which people are, and, and, the, and the fact that people are living longer, which is a good thing, um, the fact is, is that trust fund is really on a trajectory that is gonna run out of, of extra surplus funds. And this graph shows that. So again, um, this is 2018, and that's 2035, uh, which is uh, about 17 years from now. And basically, that straight line down, the, the dark line, that's what, that's what happens to the uh, Social Security Trust Fund. Now, again, that doesn't mean Social Security goes bankrupt. It doesn't mean you know, people's benefits go to zero. But that surplus was basically keeping, the, the, uh, you know, again, the head of the curve. And there will be probably an across-the-board 10% hit on the Social Security system if we don't do anything. So again, it, the clock is ticking. And, and the question is, are we going to address um, what we know is coming? I mean, this is not in dispute. Nobody disputes that. I mean, it's, it's not a partisan issue. This is just pure demographics. This is, how, this is what's, that's, this is where our country is going in terms of its aging. The Larson bill, the Social Security 2100 bill, uh, makes some modifications, which I'll mention in a minute, in terms of just uh, how the program is financed. And the checkered line shows, and again, this is where you know, we, we fall into trouble at the bottom there. The checkered line shows that, in fact, in the control of the currency, which is, you know, nonpartisan, it's an auditor. It's not a, you know, the Democratic National Committee or the Republican National Committee. Th these are the guys with the green eye shades who kind of keep an eye on the program. And they basically show that this keeps the program solvent for the next 75 years and beyond. And again, in the, in the New York Times today, uh, George Bush's, George W. Bush's uh, Social Security Administrator was quoted as saying, you know, the one thing he really likes about the, the Larson bill is, is that it fixes this problem really almost uh, permanently in terms of just the way it's financed. It does it in two fundamental ways. Number one, it goes back and looks at what they did in 1980, and it does, a, again, a very gradual step increase in terms of the withholding from 6.2% to 7%. 7 Again, this is being done in increments of 0.05% over a period of time. This is not gonna hit everybody in one fell swoop. And again, I just wanna remind people, we have done this since 1935 repeatedly in terms of trying to fix the finances of this program. This is not something new, and it's certainly not something radical in terms of just the, uh, what's, what's proposed there. The second thing is, is, is it looks at that cap the one that Warren Buffett criticized, and basically says, okay, today, you know, you, you stop paying into the system when, you, when you're at $132,000. Um, you know, we'll, we'll allow that cap to stay in, in place for sort of middle class folks, and then there's parts of the country where that actually is a middle class, still a middle class family, but above 400,000 in income, the cap is gonna come off, and people will have to, again, pay in the full 6% rate. Um, over time, that 132 and the 400 is gonna, is gonna contract, because that's just the way the, the system um, evolves, because that, that, that cap grows with inflation. 
Um, but that, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, as some of you know, Senator Sanders, that's always been his proposal, scrap the cap, as he, as he calls it, because that would allow uh, basically everybody to pay the same rate. It's, a, it's not a, you know, wild progressive increase in, in um, tax rates, but it basically says everybody pays the same. Uh, and whether you're uh, somebody, again, who's working an electric boat as an incoming welder or somebody who uh, is Warren Buffett. And, that, and what that, uh, what those two things do is, it, is again, it fixes that, that, that chart. And it makes sure that every single one of these young people who are in the back here are going to have a social security system that's going to be there to provide the, the foundation of your retirement. And it's going to make sure that every one of your friends who might lose a parent, unfortunately, is going to have a survivor's benefit so that they uh, are protected or that if you have a disability, that social security is going to be there to, to, to deal with it. It does a number of things to also fix uh, those problems that I described. It changes the cost of living adjustment. Okay, it, it introduces a whole new consumer price index. It's called CPIE, which is uh, Consumer Pr uh, Price Index Elderly. And it basically changes the basket of um, goods that um, is, is used by the Labor Department to better reflect a senior. I mean, we, we know this is a formula that's been around for years. Economists have come up with it. They, if you go back just even just the last 10 years since the Great Recession, you would have had COLA increases during that time period. Not crazy ones, not wild ones, but there would be, again, a better reflection of the true um, household budget of a senior under CPE, CPIE. The second is, is it rebases the bottom so that, there, that uh, folks who are low income, who again have qualified for their benefits, they've paid in the quarters that they, they worked for, uh, would again be at, the, uh, be at the minimum the poverty rate. You would not have seniors with the, the you know, 600 a month check, you'd have at least a baseline amount that would equal at least the, the poverty rate. And lastly, it would basically give a 2% across the board boost um, to the um, to the system because, as I said, the system has plateaued because of the recession that took place, and it's a one-time increase to just sort of rebase it. All of that still is within the fiscal parameters of what the uh, comptroller did. This is not bankrupting the system. This is not um, going crazy in terms of overpaying, uh, but it's really to adju make adjustments because the system has really, as I said, it's gotten kind of um, a little, you know, um, harsher for people uh, over the last few years. The other uh, provision is that it uh, exempts Social Security from taxation uh, at a higher level. As you know, if somebody goes out and gets a, a job who's uh, in their 60s, and, there, and there's a lot of folks that do that to try and supplement their income, their Social Security benefits are taxed once you hit $25,000 of annual income. This doubles that. It raises the threshold so that people can actually earn more if, that, if they want. No one has to. Uh, but, it, but it keeps the, the benefit from being taxed at a much higher level. And, um, and I'll tell you, I've been to other senior centers around the district. That is a, that's a real bone of contention for folks who, um, you know, are, again, trying to get some supplement, supplemental income. But, you know, there, there's obviously a huge disincentive for people if they're getting taxed uh, on their Social Security benefits uh, once they earn uh, $25,000. So, so, again, it's a tax cut for, for folks who, who, you know, go that route. It, it uh, recalculates the COLA to make it a, a more, I think, accurate um, program in terms of senior budgets. Uh, it rebases the system so that we're not having uh, uh, seniors who are in absolute poverty. And in, in my opinion, it, it really protects what I think is one of the crown jewels of our country, which is the Social Security uh, Insurance Program, not Entitlement Program. So anyway, that's a quick snapshot, 204 co-sponsors. On Wednesday, uh, we have the chairman of the uh, subcommittee on Social Security who is going to go full speed ahead in terms of moving um, this bill. I just want to tell you, I've been in Congress now 12 years. There has not been one bit of movement in the, in the last 12 years in terms of trying to address this issue, even though I hear about it constantly and we get calls about it nonstop. Uh, we're finally going to start having a real uh, substantive, um, meaningful 
uh, movement by Congress in terms of addressing uh, this issue. And, uh, and I think that's great. I think, you know, that's what I think the country is looking for. And again, it helps all generations. This is not just a senior citizen issue. This is about protecting the program for young people uh, and also, um, again, injecting more fairness into the way we finance the program. So again, as I said, there's, I know a lot of other issues that people may want to talk about, shut down, you know, we had a great submarine commissioning on Saturday, the USS South Dakota, uh, education, healthcare, uh, Medicare, which is a whole other topic. Uh, but again, I just, given the fact that this is literally less than a week old in terms of, you know, what was introduced on Wednesday, and it's real, this is not just, you know, um, pundit talk, this is a real bill with real validation, and it's gonna be connected to a real process um, in the near future. So I wanted to at least uh, get down to Groton and, and share that uh, um, information with you here today. So with that, again, if people have questions, um, we've got a mic I know that would be happy here. Morning, Joe, thank you for coming down today and thank you for presenting this, uh, what looks like very valuable information. And, and one thing that I, I just want to ask, I don't know if you can answer it, but it, it's kind of covered in here, and it brings out more arguments and more comments on Facebook and other social media when we hear the Republicans use that term entitlement. They have to know that we have been paying into this for as long as we have. Why do they consider it an entitlement when we have been paying into it? Well, again, that's a, a, a very, I think, fundamental question about just sort of, you know, what, what do you think Social Security really is? So for any of you, any of you guys out there working these days, getting a paycheck, raise your hand, some of you, anyway. So if you get your, your pay stub, you're gonna, you know, get your withholdings, you look at it, and there's a, there's a, there's a um, lettering or acronym that says FICA, okay, F-I-C-A. And what is that? That is the Federal Insurance Contribution Act. I mean, as I said, the program is an insurance program from the day Franklin Roosevelt signed it into law. And today, every uh, person who's working and has a FICA withholding, it is an insurance payment. It is not um, a, a tax, because it's in a separate account. Social Security is in a separate account. So it is an insurance program. And, I, and to me, that is a fundamental sort of question. You have to you know, get past so that we all can work together to fix this. It's not an entitlement. And, and, and I, but I mean, frankly, there's been books written about the fact that the use of that term has been really to try and denigrate um, Social Security. And these are the folks who want to privatize it or cut the benefits. Uh, you know, there's been other proposals about how to deal with Social Security. One of them is chained CPI, which would actually depress the uh, COLA even further, uh, which is, you know, given the fact that there's been zeros <laughs> over the last five years is obviously, in my opinion, the wrong way to go. Um, but, but again, it, it's sort of all part of that narrative that it's, that it's not really insurance, and, and in fact, it really is. And it's been on the books, I mean, really, this is a program that's over 75 years old. We're not talking about something that's, you know, kind of new. I mean, it's, it's now part of the fabric of our country. I think it works. Yeah. Good morning, is this one? Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for coming down and speaking to us. Uh, it sounds like something that is good, something that most of us would probably want to support. Uh, long overdue, I can certainly say that. But, and this is just a general uh, comment that with the nature of politics today, and I can just see Republican, Democrat, divide and fight, this is the kind of thing that needs uh, us to come together and work together. And while you all control the House of Representatives now, so that it would be easy to get the majority House of Representatives, you flip it over the wall to the other side, and here we go again. The Republicans don't even have to bring it forward. They can, they can table it, correct? They don't even have to bring the bill forward. So unless we can somehow, uh, and I know it sounds, you know, unless we can just stop the Democrat Republican fight and get together and here's the thing that we could get together on do you see any chance for that happening or is this just so um, <clears throat> John Larson is one of my best friends in the world let alone um, in, in the house and and we've talked about this Dan you know quite a bit because he he really doesn't want to just be 
you know, have this be a debate club. He, wa he wants to get a, a, a result. And um, he has been talking to um, House Republicans uh, about this bill. Um, some of you may know there's a congressman, Mark Meadows, from North Carolina, who's very active in the Freedom Caucus. Uh, Meadows' mother is telling Mark to support this bill, <laughs> okay? And, and, and they really are having real active, serious conversations about you know, trying to get some um, bipartisan um, support for this. You know, one other thing I would just sort of note is that if you go back to the Republican debates for president um, in 2016, Social Security came up at one of the debates, and, and they were asked, again, about um, the candidates' different proposals on it. And most of them that were on the stage actually said we should cut um, benefits. We've you know, we got this fiscal crisis, blah, blah, blah. The one candidate who actually said no to that was actually President Trump. He, he, and I, you know, I think, and again, John um, has been talking to some folks in the White House about the fact that you know, if you want your sort of Ronald Reagan Tip O'Neill moment. I mean, this this is really an opportunity uh, for that to happen. I, I, again, you know, I don't have to. I'm not going to be um, naive here. It, it's very tough down there. It's very polarized, and you know, there there are people who are dug in on Social Security. You know, with very deep ideological positions here. But I also think do not underestimate the power of external pressure in terms of getting. Um, Things to, to move uh, down there, and and I think that you know as as the the information begins to really circulate about this issue again, it's less than a week old uh, as a bill, and it's gotten uh, actually fantastic coverage. Um, uh, because and 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 again, I we watch what comes into our office in terms of phone calls, emails. Um, you know, just casework that, that comes in into the office there, and you know whether it's you know issue of the day, you name it. Um, consistently, Social Security and Medicare has this you know baseline of volume that every, I know I'm not alone in that. That is every member, and if there's something that's out there that people understand is actually going to help fix this problem, I, I don't. I just say don't underestimate that. But it, but we haven't had anything. I mean, we literally have not had anything over certainly the time I've been there. And, and the fact that we're going to get a bill with traction, that creates its own momentum at some point. And, um, and that's why I, I think um, it's important to just kind of at least, with all the other stuff that we're going to be faced with, to, to sort of spotlight this um, and, and really try and build that kind of uh, public external support. Sir, you had a question. Yeah, good morning, sir. Yeah. Oh, glad to able to join us here this morning. I, I think you pretty much answered my question, actually, because I was going to say, what are the chances of this thing having bipartisan support? So I, well, I think again, I, I think, it. you know, we're, I believe very strongly that we're going to get a vote in the House. And um, it may not be exactly, you know, every cross T and dotted I that, that was introduced on Wednesday. And I know John is, is somebody who's very focused on trying to build um, Alliances outside of just uh, one one side, and and so, um, uh, but again, you you heard my 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 spiel, and I'll I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks for coming. In. First, a, a little bit on the. Uh, I'd like to just thank you guys for sticking to it on the shutdown, and uh, I think that was the right thing to do, and. Uh, I, I, most of the country's behind you, and I think that was great. I, I just wanted to go a little bit on a side issue in the Social Security. You mentioned the disability program, and when I was working, I was representing clients with Social Security disability cases. And I, I would urge you to ask uh, Congressman Larson to look into that, because over the last few years, um, lots and lots of people who have been, who are certainly qualified for disability have been turned down because there's been nationwide a reduction in the grant rate uh, and it's I think because they've been going out to get judges who just are absolutely absurd. I mean I, I could stand here and tell stories all day but, but my favorite is if I have a client still in the, in the system after 10 years, two federal, um, two federal appeals we had to go through. Um, he was turned down. Part of his problem is he has terrible knees. The judge said he didn't believe that his knees were as bad as he said they were because he testified that he could watch television lying down. That's the kind of logic that we've had to deal with uh, to try to get people on disability. And 
I really think that needs to be looked into because those people paid in too and they're not getting their benefits. So thank you. Well, I mean, I think your story though is, is another one of these sort of reality-based um, rebuttals because there's folks who, who you know, spread these urban myths that, you know, um, a sneeze and you get social security disability, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, it, it's very di challenging and very difficult to, to um, get over the legal threshold for, for qualifying. You have to have a real chronic condition. I mean, you're the expert, so you could explain that much better than I. One thing that I would note, uh, Larson's bill does, that I think is helpful to the disability program, is it actually, uh, as you know, there's two separate accounts that exist today for older Americans and survivors are in one bucket and the disability program is funded, again, it's all Social Security, but it's, it's funded out of a different bucket. And we've actually had a few moments where uh, there were folks who were trying to um, keep the, you know, actually uh, hurt the, the disability program. And, and John's, John's actually rolls it all into, into one account, which uh, means that, you know, they're all sort of, um, you know, joined together, which I think is, is a really good sort of, in, um, you know, protection for people that they're, they're, that the disability bucket isn't going to suddenly go dry. Uh, back to the shutdown. Yeah. I want to know when Congress is going to eliminate that ridiculous thing that no municipality, no state, no successful company could run like that. Why is, why are we? So, I mean, there's a lot of um, actually bills that are starting to surface on this issue. Um, again, if you go back to, you know, the the source, the legal source of why why this occurs. Uh, again, the federal government is funded on an annual basis. Every fiscal year, um, you know, the, the the different agencies are broken down into 11 different spending bills. Uh, we we passed in September 75 percent of those spending bills. There was again 25 percent that that were not included. They were just given what's called a continuing resolution, which is sort of spending on automatic pilot from the prior years numbers and uh, and again that's because the homeland security um, bill was uh, still undecided because of border issues um, december 20th came along uh, there still wasn't agreement again this was under the prior um, control and um, mitch mcconnell actually passed a, a continuation bill that would have kept the government going through february and then obviously that changed literally overnight after the the senate had already acted I mean, senators were in planes flying home when they got the word that the White House uh, was not going to sign that measure. So when that, so why why that happens is because um, there was a legal opinion in a law that was passed on, back in the '70s that basically said that if if an account is not passed, that the government has no authority to to make any payments. It's called the Anti-Deficit Act, and. In all honesty, back then, I mean, from talking to people, you know, who've done the research, uh, no one ever really expected that, you know, we would be in a situation where the, the place would actually really shut down, that it was just a way of trying to keep sort of, um, you know, people's feet to the fire to, to sort of get the work done in a timely fashion. But we're now into about the fourth or fifth shutdown since starting in the 1990s. And, and clearly, you know, I personally, I feel like we, we should not enable that. We should not make that the new normal because, we, you know, the, the, really we should do our budgets on time and, um, and, and not have to uh, have government on automatic pilot. Because, you know, what happens is, is that programs get messed up if they're getting last year's appropriations. Electric Boat, by the way, is a classic example of that. I mean, the funding for the, the Virginia class program, it's not a level line every year. It changes from one year to the next. So having continuous funding is really not an optimal solution. Having said all that, there's, there's two bills um, that um, have been introduced in the House. Uh, one by um, a congressman from Philadelphia, a young guy, uh, which basically just would say that if, um, if there's not resolution to a spending bill, that the, it would trigger an automatic continuing resolution for 90 days so that the doors would not close. There's another one in the Senate, which actually would, would fully fund it for a whole year. I don't like that because for all the reasons I said, it just, it, it's not good budgeting, you know, when, when you just have automatic um, spending like that. So, um, 
you know, it, it's it's it, it's out there right now that we really should not have the doors close when the, when there's lack of resolution um, to to a spending bill. I mean, right now, again, just for the update, you know, there, there's a conference committee that's meeting um, February 15th, uh, week from Friday, um, is when the, uh, the most recent CR expires uh, for those 25 percent of the government agencies, and. Um, you know, I've talked to some of the House members who are on the conference. They, by and large, it's members from the border districts that were appointed, which I think is good because I think that you know they live with the reality of this, and they actually feel like they're making some progress in terms of um, you know border measures uh, without you know a full-blown wall, and um, and we'll see. I mean, frankly, they've got to get a, a conference report out this week if it's really going to get voted on intelligently before a week from Friday. And, um, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot about it tomorrow night in the State of the Union address uh, as well. Well, but that's what a CR, that, I mean, that's what a CR would do. That's what a CR, it would keep the payroll going. And um, um, so and that's, and, and for that, you know, minimum, benefit i mean i think there's going to be a lot of support for doing that but you know again there's part of me that's like you know what that's not the real problem the real problem is we gotta we gotta go back to what dan said we gotta get people to get the, the work done this is not a debate club you know you, you act when when you're in a legislative body is this social security increase that's going to happen going to affect more our younger people that are going to go out and work and the minimum wages still stay the same, will they be able to afford to be on their own? Would they be able to educate themselves? So again, as uh, President Reagan and did back in the 1980s, it's not like a, you know, a, a, it was dropped in one fell swoop. This is tiny increments between now and 2040, okay? And um, it, it, it doesn't hit them hard, it's a lower income worker doesn't get hit harder than 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 a um, upper income. I mean, and and really, I've never heard anyone say repeal my Social Security payroll tax. I mean, people, you know, they understand what 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 that's for, which is to protect people when they're when they fall victim to things that they can't control, which is aging, a lost parent, or uh, a disability condition that has to be extremely chronic before the system uh, recognizes it. So, but really, at some point, you know, that, that chart is like a big warning sign, particularly for young people. I look at this through the lens of my kids in terms of just, you know, why should they continue to pay 6% if, they're, if, they're about to, if the whole system is about to go off a cliff at that point, and they're going to end up really paying the, the real price in terms of a degraded system uh, when, when it, God forbid, you know, they might need it uh, before 65 or after 65. And... Um, we have had tremendous support from groups around the country. Paralyzed Veterans of America, by the way, endorsed the bill immediately because they deal with veterans who, um, again, have conditions that are not always covered by the VA because it may be, it's not every one of their um, conditions is service related. Um, so, um, you know, it's, and I'd be happy to share that with you in terms of just the, the mixture of people that are coming out in support of this. And if we just do nothing, if we just kind of let this thing kind of drift, uh, as I said, I think young people are the ones who are, who are going to take it on the chin the worst. Anybody else? We brought some good handouts if you want more information. Yep. So don't leave without free paper. PSA. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not much of a public speaker, but I want to thank you for all the work you do. I have been getting your emails regularly, and I appreciate all the information and all the effort you put into everything that happens here. For our area, I wish there was more of you. Well, thank you. That's got nowhere to go but downhill uh, after that. So, um, but again, we do have an e-newsletter which we send out. Try to be, you know, punctual every Friday afternoon. Just sort of quick updates in terms of what's going on in the district in Washington. We have about seventy thousand subscribers, believe it or not, um, which is bigger than New London Day and even the Hartford Current. Um, but again, we don't overload it. it keep, we try to keep it a manageable length. And we get great feedback from people from it because it's it's we want it to be a dialogue, not just a one-way, um, you know, street. You know, one yeah. thing I would like to say, though, you have these what they call town hall meetings, yes. and you call it 6 p.m. I understand 
that's a bad time for maybe, I don't know how many people you get on that, but it doesn't work for me. Okay. So the last telephone town hall we did, which was uh, two weeks ago, was at six o'clock, and it was partly because of vote schedules that were happening. We still had 8,000 people on the call, and, um, and we're gonna do more of those, and we're gonna do more live events as well, because um, it's a great district. I mean, as, as rough as it is down there, you know, I feel very, lucky to have um, you know just a wonderful uh, I, my family goes back four generations in Connecticut and I, I love this state and I love this area so it's it's really a, a, an honor every day anybody else yeah <laughs> oh, rough, rough down in Washington. Rough down in Washington. Yeah. No, th this place, are you kidding? I come home to get good karma. <laughs> Which, by the way, the commissioning on Saturday was, was very good karma. It's a very proud moment when you got folks from South Dakota. I mean, we had hundreds of people, from, and, and they get a chance to see the region and just listen to the story about the amazing work that, that happens here. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And, um, and I get a lot of members who actually want to come up and visit because they, they realize something special is really happening here. Yep. Hmm. I have a question. Yep. Uh, and there probably are a few Republicans hanging out in here, but I don't I hope you don't shoot them. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, how does this affect the business uh, that is paying in the other half of the FICA? So, um, you know, as I said, we, we, John has been talking a lot, particularly to the financial sector about the fact that you know we really do have kind of a looming retirement um, problem out there because um, uh, you know pensions are really almost becoming a thing of the past and um, you know the, the the it was always supposed to be a multi-legged you know stool for retirement and Social Security was one of the legs not um, the only leg I mean part of it was pension and part of it was your own investments and and right now when you look at that you know, looming baby boomer surge, it's kind of scary in terms of how underfunded people are and unprepared they are for retirement. So I, I actually, um, you know, the feedback we've gotten, certainly at least in that particular sector of the economy, is very positive in terms of um, trying to, again, create a, a little stronger foundation for people when they hit um, retirement. And, uh, you know, um, we're prepared to have that conversation with any other employer groups in terms of the withholding. Again, I, I, I think, and we have the tables, I think, in this terms of, no, no, it is. No, I was an employer for 25 years before I went to Congress. I, I know that well, okay? And, and that's right, but, and that's why we have the chart here. But again, I just want to emphasize that over time, we have made these adjustments, just like you would with any kind of annuity or private um, investment vehicle, because, um, you know, at some point, you know, you just don't want to get into this um, situation. So what you're saying is businesses are also in with you. In this is a pretty new, this bill is pretty fresh, but as I said, you know, this is, but it's been we've talked about and worked on over the last, really about six years or so. And, um, and we're really not getting some big thing from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce or any of the, the you know, the business groups that are out there right now. And I think that, um, as I said, the, the, this issue of retirement security is something that, um, you know, we get the Hartford, you know, we get Mass Mutual, they get Fidelity. I mean, they, they kind of parade through your office, and, and this is a real concern for them. Yeah. Is Social Security in this situation because it spread itself out in the original thought? Well, again, when, when um, Reagan and O'Neill uh, did the deal, you know, the agreement back in the 1980s, I mean, the, the three fundamental um, beneficiaries, you know, seniors, um, orphans, and people on disability, that had already, that's, that was well established by the 1980s. So it, the, the problem we have is just that it's, you know, I grew up in a family, I'm 65 now, so I'm a, I'm a real baby boomer, you know, right in the heart of all that. And, uh, and, you know, we had five kids in our family. I mean, and we were the smallest uh, Irish Catholic family on the street, you know, when we were there, because that's just what was happening in, in our society. And obviously, we're not seeing birth rates and, um, 
and, and we're seeing it with our school districts, I'm sure many of you know, in terms of school population is going down. So there, there's a demographic thing that's, that's really, in my opinion, that's the, been the biggest change that's happened. Not that the system has become overly generous in terms of extending benefits to other people. As John uh, pointed out, I mean, it is really difficult to get a disability claim um, through, through the process. There's no question that birth rates have been have not been maintained the same way it was during the baby boom years. I mean that's, but again, it's gonna it, that's a hump through the system. And once that all of us, you know, get off the system one way or another, um, I mean, really, then you're gonna see but stability. But this is but this is not gonna be for a while because Americans are living longer. I mean, when life expectancy when uh, Medicare uh, was passed was in the 1965, was still in the high 60s. I mean, it's close to 80 now, particularly for women who, you know, uh, live the longest of all. So, um, you know, those changes uh, just are, I mean, they're good problems to have in some ways. But this lesser population right. coming in. No, it's, it's, it's. Is a problem. Absolutely. Which I talk to my kids so about, so. Absolutely. That's, I mean, that's certainly, um, you know, anytime you have a, a new person added to the U.S. payroll, whether it's because they're, you know, native born who reach working age or whether they're from overseas, it all pay, that increases the, the, the revenue into the system. Correct. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to say on the issue that, about the, uh, the funding, one of the problems from the Reagan years is that when they, when the actuaries figured out how much money needed to be coming in, they did not accurately predict the level of inequality that has taken place since 1983. They just didn't, they didn't expect that we'd have as much inequality as we do. And because the people at the top aren't paying Social Security taxes except on their first $125,000 of income, the revenue coming in is less than what was what was expected and on that issue i would hope that you vets in the in congress will listen to some of these new people coming in i personally think that michael dell and howard schultz should be paying more income tax <laughs> and so does warren buffett <laughs> thank you yeah. great well thank you so much for the the invitation I'll, you know, be happy to hang out for a little bit and maybe talk individually. By the way, if people have individual questions in terms of, um, you know, yourself or your friends or whatever, I mean, we've got business cards here for, uh, we've got a great team that helps people with issues with, uh, whether it's Social Security, Medicare, the VA, um, you name it. Um, um, you know, we've got a really nice group that, that do good things and get real results for people. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to stick around.